Yo, yo, yo. What's up? What is up, you outsiders? Um, hope everybody had a good weekend. Uh, always too fast, right? Always goes too fast. Fast. Um, we are also in August at this point, man. <laughs> this year has just been cruising, cruising, man. Um, kind of, kind of crazy. Um, day twenty-one of some Witcher three ahead of us. After we do some video gaming news, yeah. I don't know. Hope everybody had a great weekend. I know it it's uh usually feels a bit bad getting back into the uh the weekdays and everything, but I don't know. Hopefully you had a good weekend and uh hopefully the next one will be here pretty quick for you. <laughs> Alright. Let's uh let's get in this let's get in this video gaming news. Let's do what we do. Yeah. Let's hop over here. Let's do this. And then we'll uh we'll get into some Witcher 3 for the rest of the day. Yeah. Cool. Um pull this up. Let's see. Let's see. Um, uh, here's the thing. I read something like this and because of everything that I have seen already in the gaming industry regarding, uh, you know, what so many devs have to offer at this point regarding blockchain, NFTs, web three, their incorporation, their, the way they are incorporating it into our games right now. Seeing something like this, like gaming vets promise to make blockchain games fun. I just kind of scoff at this and go, nah, I doubt it. But we'll pull it up and we'll see what it says, okay? We read about this Indonesia stuff. I mean, we're talking all kinds of uh, platforms. Uh, banking, monetary platforms through Gaming platforms, Steam and Epic, uh, stuff like that. All kinds of things are, are kind of banned in Indonesia right now because of some kind of crazy regulations they have going on that um, these companies have not complied with. So uh, we'll see what happens moving forward. Yep, yeah, um, I'm not going to dive into this. They're talking about making a uh, some kind of vending machine. Uh out of a Raspberry Pi, I I promote Raspberry Pi quite often just because it is a they are very very nice little micro computer, uh, micro computers that you can use to build all kinds of different things with. So if you uh are looking to build some kind of niche tech gadget or whatever, Raspberry Pi could be your go to for that platform that you're trying to create. Uh, as well as if you're just trying to work your way into being more familiar with uh, tech related things, you know, diving into um, a bit of the uh, hands on regarding tech in uh, apart from just playing uh, games on it or using it for um you know, the utility that computers usually are. Uh, Raspberry Pi is a really nice, easy, inexpensive way to work your way into that realm. Sony says it believes Xbox owning Call of Duty could influence, uh, I think, console choice. Player's console choice. Yeah, I mean, to an extent, it will. Hmm. The Last of Us TV show will explore different avenues to the games. I'm not going to dive into that article. Uh, I don't think that that's real surprising to see that.
I didn't expect the the uh the show to be I mean absolutely exactly what the game had to offer so we'll see um there have been obviously some very good game adaptations taken into movie and uh you know TV series and then there have been some very very poor ones and until it comes out it's hard to tell but we'll find out Uh, PS Plus is getting one of the game's uh, most beloved franchises before 2022 comes to a close. See what we got there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Henry Cavill has PC hardware issues just like you and me. If you don't know who this is, this is the individual that, that the latest actor to play Superman in the movies. This is the individual that plays the Witcher. Um, what a lot of people don't know about Henry Cavill is that um, he is a big D&D &D nerd. He is a big gaming nerd. And um, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really don't think they could have cast anybody better to play Geralt. He... Uh, he has a good amount of knowledge about that character before he even took that role. And uh, from what I understand, took it even a step further in, in diving. I think he already knew a, a good amount about the text and everything beforehand, but even took it a step further in, in um, helping out with, while filming, kind of telling the director and, and, and things during filming that, you know, this is what Geralt would have said in this situation or, or this is, we should use this line from the actual books, uh, uh, during this, you know, to, to try to help, um, I guess really get the series, portray the series for its essence of what the Witcher is and really, really bring it to fruition to many of the the people that love that world um and i think they did a pretty good job and i don't think they could have cast anybody better but um yeah of course i mean you know everybody ends up with some uh tech issues if you use tech at all you end up with tech issues and again that goes back to the whole raspberry pi thing that's why i think that if you use technology and most of us do nowadays it's only going to benefit you to uh at least have some kind of know-how on how to troubleshoot things, whether it be hof uh, hardware, software related. Uh, so to an extent, you can try to troubleshoot things yourselves and, and figure things out. In some form or fashion, at some point during your time spent using technology, something will go wrong. That is just the way it goes. Um, something here about, uh, Microsoft says there's nothing unique about Activision ellipses. Let's see what this is.
Um, is this just talking uh, motherboards, based gaming PCs? Uh, okay. Let's take a quick look at that. Let's pivot real quick. Ooh, Disco Elysium Dev seeks artists with a love of sci-fi and um, ellipses. Let's see what this is. Um, I actually bought Disco Elysium, uh, Elysium not too long back, and this is going to be the next story-rich kind of CRPG type game that we play in this channel. Disco Elysium is supposed to be very, very good. It'll be a long playthrough, but I'm really excited for it. We've talked about all this stuff previously. We talked about uh, Dead Drop, which is the game coming out of Dr. Disrespect's um, development studio. We talked about that yesterday. It's, it's still very early in the development of that game. Um, I think it's getting uh, an amount of <laughs> criticism right now that might not be necessarily warranted just based off of what people have gotten to experience in the game because basically you, you know it, it's it's very 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 early access for that game so basically people that have gotten their hands on try at it it's just maneuvering through an environment a map you there are some target dummies around for you to be able to try one single gun out at this point um that's about it so People are going, what is this? You know, but I mean, it's it's early in the development of that game. People just need to probably chill out a little bit. What I will say is, even though I'm not a fan of the, the way they went about giving people ac early access to the game of here, you know, 50, you know, what was it? 10,000 limited nfts for the game at 50 bucks a pop and if you buy one you get early access to the game um but with that said like i am really really not a fan of that that play right there but with that said at least they are actually giving those people that bought in access right i mean the thing that sucks for them is that And, and, and I think this is the problem. You you gave people uh, a chance to buy into some early access content. And then, you know, now you feel obligated to give people continued early access, which is good on you. You're, you're giving them that. But now people are getting this early access and you're getting kind of uh, criticism for what, what they're being exposed to, you know. Um Constructive criticism is good, but people are just going, what is this? There's nothing in here. There's nothing to do. It's just, you know, because it's in, it's early development and, and people just, uh, that's the way, that's the way people are going to be, but it's a, it's a weird situation. I think, I think, I don't know. Talked about that already a couple times, as well as this. This was a really good article, too. Yep, read about that.
Yeah, Wizards of the Coast, we knew about, we've read about this as well. They have a new uh, development studio, Skeleton Key. Madden NFL 23 fixes a major problem that's been plaguing the series. Let's see what's going on there. We saw this too. It's actually somebody did a really, really good job with uh, throwing basically the bully trailer into uh, UE5, and it looked really, really good. Besides some kind of nightmare fuel type of. Uh, mouthing action during dialogue from a lot of the characters it was very very weird looking but other than that i mean and it, it was just a, a fan made kind of thing and it looked really good gave everybody a really good look at what uh, a, a modern version of bully like a remake I mean, it would look even better than that, but it gave everybody a look at what it would be. I'm actually surprised MTV, MTV, I said this yesterday. I saw this come up, MTV Video Music Awards as best metaverse performance for virtual concerts. I didn't even know MTV was still a, an actual thing. Uh, it's kind of wild. Stick with this. Let's just see what we got here. Uh, Disco Elysium Dev seeks artist with a love of sci-fi and video games. More things in heaven and earth uh, than are dreamt of philosophy. That's a really great piece of art. Disco Elysium creator Z-A-U-M is looking for artists with a love of sci-fi and video games and the ability to create non-earth environments. As spotted by the eagle-eyed members of the Disco Elysium subreddit, job listings for the three new artistic positions at the studio are perhaps hinting what themes and motives may be apparent in the studio's next game. Interestingly, fans of the RPG don't necessarily think this marks a big departure for the team, though especially given, quote, how much time the creators have put into cultivating the setting of Disco Elysium. Uh, not sure how much things have changed at the company, but the leads have talked about how much time they've spent put it put how much time they've put into cultivating the setting of Disco Elysium, which is also the setting of the lead writer's book, and how they intend to use it a lot moving forward, explained the Frank of Turducken. <laughs> what a name. So my guess is that it'll be the same world as uh, DE, but in a different specific place in it. That said, specifically referencing Hamlet by asking for someone who understands that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of philosophy, as well as architecture or city planning and new worlds. It certainly has fans speculating on what's next for the uh, team. A new deal between Amazon and DJ2 Entertainment could see both Life is Strange and Disco Elysium being adapted for film and TV. Amazon recently made a deal with the Sonic Film co-producer to create and produce content that will exclusively stream on Prime Video, including TV adaptations of gaming IP, as specifically including the above games. Disco Elysium, the final cut, was banned in Australia after its classification board refused to classify it back in March 2021 because it depicts, expresses, or otherwise deals with matters of sex, drug misuse, or addiction, crime, cruelty, violence, or revolting or abhorrent phenomena in such a way that they uh, offended against the standards of morality, decency, and propriety generally accepted by reasonable adults to the extent that they should not be classified. This decision was overturned the following May, however, with the censored games, high impact themes, coarse language, and drug references securing an 18 restricted category. This happens quite often in Australia. Uh, what was the last game this happened to? God. Why can't I think about the name of that game right now? It'll come to me uh, after the news, probably. Um, this happens quite often in Australia. 
they'll they'll have games to get banned, won't get rated, and they'll get banned, and then it'll come back and get reassessed and and overturned, and um, yeah, you see that a lot. Madden NFL 23 fixes a major problem that's been plaguing the series. Uh, Madden 23 is expected to fix a long-running problem that's been plaguing the series for years. Although, yeah, that company. Although EA Sports games get a lot of fair criticism for not changing too much year over year. Yep. That's another one of those... Uh, Another one of those companies that uh, they're not looking to evolve their 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 games uh, and build off of and improve off of the the development year to year. They just lean on what they've been doing forever. Um, there have been major strides to innovate and refine the incredibly successful formula over the years. The series has come a long way from its earliest days, now allowing fans to participate in a variety of modes like. Ultimate Team, which is in like every EA Sports game, and this is their loot box stuff, okay? Franchise mode, and even in recent years, a single-player campaign complete with branching paths, A-list stars, and much more. Nevertheless, Madden fans continue to feel ignored by EA when it comes to particular issues. One of the issues in Madden stems from franchise mode and bidding on free agents. Players have realized that although there are scheduled times to bid on these things, it doesn't really matter so long as you come in slightly over at the very last second. It's a pretty classic tactic for eBay users, but it's incredibly aggravating in a video game, which could, in theory, prevent things like this. Thankfully, according to GameSpot, Madden NFL 23 seeks to address this matter in a rather clever way. Now, the game won't let you see the other player's bids or exactly where your lands, where yours lands compared to other bids. It's less about competing to drop a stack of in-game ca in cash on a player and more about making the best offer that feels reasonable and not just making ridiculous bids. Wow. Um, that seems like just logical, and it should have been in there in the first place. Players will also reportedly have four offer templates to help streamline the experience. Max offer player-friendly, team-friendly, or neutral. Of course, players can still tweak it to their preferences if they desire. This uh, change both eliminates a frustrating issue and helps create a more realistic experience for players. As of right now, Madden NFL 23 seems to be shaping up quite nicely. Only time will tell if it really takes the series to the next level but it's at least taking the steps to fix issues that fans have been annoyed with. There you go. Um, gaming vets promise to make blockchain games fun and sustainable. Again, uh, before I even pulled this up, um, I think this is one of those sites that, that I try to stay away from because it seems like every time I see something come up on here from, uh, they, they quite often are spamming articles regarding how good, uh, you know, Blockchain uh, NFTs. Crypto-based gaming is. All that stuff, you know. Um, I think this is one of those sites. I'm not positive, but I think. Uh, ultimately, for me, I'm a little bit skeptical of uh, anybody incorporating this kind of mechanic into their game so far because uh, it's just been incorporated very badly for the most part in the industry. And is this a, an article to read? I mean, what are we doing here? What is this site, dude? Why did that take me all the way to the bottom? What was happening there? Uh, the runway success of Axie Infinity who got hacked for 600 million of their crypto. Um, they were successful, but they also 
left a huge vulnerability in their system that allowed them to get hacked for the majority of their crypto-based economy. And Step In has convinced a flurry of entrepreneurs at Web3 Gaming where the ownership of an of in-game assets is in the hand of users via blockchain app. Adoption rather than a centralized platform is the future. Some of the biggest hits in the space to date reward users with tokens that can be cashed out in what's known as play to earn. While play to earn games have attracted millions of players and billions of dollars from investors, veterans of the gaming industry argue they are fundamentally uns unsustainable. These games uh, are the brainchild of financial engineers aiming to get rich rather uh, quickly rather than experienced developers building time-honored works, they say. Axie Infinity's dramatic rise and fall is telling. After peaking at $754 million in November when Bitcoin hit an all-time high, the game's monthly sales volume plummeted to $4.5 million in July. Again, a big part of that was because um, they also... Now, crypto... Anything that's based on a crypto economy is going to... How crypto is doing is going to affect that that economy, right? But how those, uh, you know, the, the currency, specifically that the economy of that game is based on, it, it, you know, how it's doing in the market is also going to affect. Now, again, Axie Infinity, one of the reasons it crashed so hard is because they got hacked and, and most of their, their crypto and I think it was based on Ethereum, uh, got stolen. Like 600 million US dollars worth of Ethereum, I think uh, it was, got got taken. And that's something important for people to keep, uh, take into consideration. Um, you get into these, these ventures where it, you're locked into real money scenario you're investing in these these gaming ventures right um real money is involved it's only as safe as these developers make it right so they're going to tell you it's safe of course they're going to tell you it's safe but ultimately if they're not maintaining security on their side of the software and their servers and things like that there's always the potential that something just like what happened to axi infinity could happen to whatever you're planning on you know, investing in and, and being a part of. Most GameFi developers are not game developers, says, uh, I don't know what that first, how to pronounce that first name, Berno, uh, who's spearheading the new metaverse business of Polish gaming studio reality. And there's metaverse too. Love that, love that trending word. Uh, Berno is among a spate of blockchain believing gaming veterans around the world trying to take blockchain games to the mainstream. Their vision is to counter the public impression that Web3 games popularized by pay-to-earn are all scammy and trashy. Instead, they want to build games that are both fun and sustainable while introducing cryptocurrencies as a novel way to incentivize gamers as well as creators. Um, is it a game? The problem with pay-to-earn, as seen by Siwon Tung, a farmer, uh, former senior technical director at uh, EA and CTO of Web3 gaming startup Red Door Digital, is that users have to spend money up front to start playing. Yeah, it's an investment. In Axie Infinity, users buy and breed cute blob-like creatures called Axies. I think they were actually based, uh, most of the creatures in the game were based off of uh, oxalotls, I think, in the form of non-fungible tokens that are authenticated on the blockchain. Sales from the NFTs then go towards funding rewards for those who uh, earn tokens by playing and the tokens. Uh, the game's native cryptocurrency can in turn be cashed out. That means for the game to be sustainable, it must have a constant influx of new users or it loses its financing source. That's why critics compare pay-to-earn games to pyramid schemes. Uh-huh. Many of the pay-to-earn titles aren't really games by strict definition, Toon argues. They are more akin to decentralized finance or DeFi products with gamified features. Hardcore gamers dismiss Axie Infinity as simple or even boring, not unlike the free-to-play, mindless mobile games that they have opposed for years. Um, but for those living in developing countries, the prospect of making several hundred dollars per month by clicking on a computer screen can be tempting. That's largely why Axie Infinity took off in countries like the Philippines during the pandemic when people lost jobs. To them, the game is more like work than fun. I think there's a bit of elitism in it. 
Uh, yo, gamer, what's up, buddy? Yeah, 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 yeah. You get that, dude. Uh, Simon Davis, CEO of Mighty Bear Games, a Singapore-based Web3 gaming studio that just raised $10 million in a token sale, says of Axie Infinity Critics. There is a tendency in Western countries to dismiss things that are popular in other parts of the world and not be as respectful as you should be. If you look especially at Southeast Asia and Latin America and countries where incomes are probably less high, People don't buy high-end gaming rigs and consoles. It's interesting to people uh, to provide people not just with entertainment, but also with potential economic upside. I don't like the term play to earn, continues Davis, formerly a design manager at Ubisoft. I don't think it should be a primary motivation because you're playing a game to have fun. Someone can then decide they don't want to play the game anymore and get some of their investment back then. I don't see how that's a bad thing. We will discuss this. Play and earn. While Davis recognized... Yo, Wick, what's up, dude? While Davis recognized the values of pay to, uh, pay to earn, like many other experienced game developers entering Web3, he's pouring resources into perfecting the gameplay first and foremost. His studio has been uh, producing conventional games like uh, official Disney and Pixar game and Butter Royale, a hit on Apple Arcade before turning to blockchain. Soon be launching its first Web3 title, a multiplayer third-person battle royale that incorporates the token economy. Games can be both fun to play and lucrative. Some blockchain game developers argue it's not news that gamers are motivated to make money even in more developed parts of the world. Remember uh, WoW? There's already a group of players in the MMO game who hire tons of people in Vietnam and Indonesia to farm gold. Dude, that's been going on forever, though. When you look at a traditional game, people are putting millions or billions of dollars into the gateway, but it's on the other extreme. They don't get any value back. Bernal agrees. People want to play for fun. They are willing to spend money that makes them feel happy. Also, those who want to invest so you can give them a tool to invest. Developers are also promised uh, greater rewards from blockchain and integrated games. In free-to-play games, a common monetization model of today, developers earn income by pushing an update every six to eight weeks. Uh, users get annoyed that you're trying to squeeze money out of them every two months. In Web3 games, in contrast, developers get a small percentage of every in-game transaction, which is recorded on the blockchain. So the only thing you uh, have to worry about is creating a game that people want to keep playing for a very long time, creating value for those assets of the players who want to trade between themselves. Tokenomics. To make a blockchain game sustainable, Toons Red Door Digital is taking a different approach from Axie Infinity. Users don't need to buy the platform's tokens in order to start playing unless they want to start earning or having real value in their assets. When a game sustains a recurring user base, the value of the game will increase and external investors will join. Reckons Tomb. All this increase in value then goes to the people who are playing to get financial returns. Like many Web3 games, Red Door Digital's platform offers utility tokens. Look, this is the same kind of mechanic that any kind of like... This is the same mechanic that, that any kind of any kind of game with pay to win or you know it, it's like or, or pay to win um, pay to earn pay to uh, you name it right Mamzell, what's up? It, it's like, this is tried and true, okay? This is not something new. Everybody does this that wants to try to make more money off their games. It's the same thing that Diablo Immortal did. You create a good game. You create a game that has entertaining and um, engaging gameplay in it, you know, and, and, um, and you go, well, you don't have to invest, you don't, you know, but if you really want to get the full effect of the game, you know, at some point you're going to have to. You start spending time in the game, right? You start spending time in the game. That's the way it works. You, you, you start spending time in the game and, uh, you don't, what they're saying, you know, you don't have to spend money. You don't have to spend money. Um, but if you want to get the full effect of the game, you want to, you want to, have it, uh, you know, experience everything the game has to offer. Eventually, you're going to need to. You're going to need to invest. You're going to need to get uh, 
get involved in 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 the uh, investing of this title to ha- to enjoy everything it has. Will everybody feel that way? No, they might just try it out and say no. But this is a tried and true kind of implementation that developers will do to hook people, to hook game players into um, spending money within the title. Right? That that's the way it works. Like many Web3 games, uh, Red Door Digital's platform offers utility tokens, which are used like in-game currencies for purchasing skins, items, and so on, as well as govern, uh, governance tokens. Users who contribute to the game will get governance tokens and be able to vote on critical project decisions. The utility tokens can be traded, while the governance tokens have no liquidity to strip them of any spe- uh, speculative value. While developers are still working to optimize their uh, token economy, Investors are already plowing big money into their uh, nascent ventures. Blockchain games attracted a whopping $2.5 billion in funding in quarter two. Uh, a data company, according to DAP Radar, a data company that tracks decentralized apps. In H1, um, blockchain games counted for about 30% of all the capital raised by private gaming companies. Because that's what all these major companies, that's all they see, right? That's all they see. They just... It's all about making money. That's why so much money is being invested in blockchain, NFT, crypto-based uh, games. Uh, because they see the potential for it to turn into such a huge... Because it's all based around just making more money, right? This is the thing that is so concerning for me. Uh They're trying to put a spin on this like um, games can still be fun built on, you know, NFT, blockchain, crypto, this whole thing that we've we've seen be such a scam from the get go, you know, and and um, I've even said from the first that like incorporating things like NFTs don't necessarily have to be a super scummy thing. It can be something that's mutually beneficial, right? But in my opinion, it literally, it has to be absolutely, to the greatest extent, mutually beneficial, if not more beneficial to the gamer than maybe even the developer. Because at the end of the day, what, you know, a lot of, and the thing I'm worried about is, is like, this this needs to be something that is separated from what traditional the traditional gaming industry is. Um, I don't see this going away, right? And um, the whole NFT blockchain this is this is like play to earn. Trying to this is taking a lot of the fun out of games actually, and it it's 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 like a job for people. Um, that's where I get really worried about this. I, I do not want our, our traditional gaming world, even though it's super, super polluted right now already with, you know, real scummy kinds of um, mechanics that are incorporated to uh, pull more money out of people. I mean, it's already at a, a bad spot. I, I This is just going to make it even worse. And... Um, I don't think there's any way to to keep them separated, you know, um, but this is just really going to wreck the gaming industry, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this turns what we uh, so many of us that are are lovers of games, what what games mean to us as just an escape and something to have fun with and, and enjoyment in our lives into uh, something that is totally different that even if you start off playing these types of games as something that you think is fun it if you get invested in it as a financial kind of business decision it no longer is a game that you are doing for fun it i i i I do not think that the longer you you stay in it and the more you're invested in it as a business decision I do not think that it stays something that is enjoyable in a way that gaming has been traditionally. I think that 
it it starts becoming your job, right? And that is the thing that's very concerning for me. Despite the torrent of VC money floating into Web3 games, some legacy studios and publishers seem to err on the side of caution. Tencent, the world's largest gaming company, has no development plans for Web3 games that are of public knowledge. Uh, reputation is a big thing for corporate, so if anyone who creates this initiative fails, it's the end of their career. They will have to answer to the board, says Toon. The only way is for them to invest in a crypto company or two to see how it goes. The gold rush into Web3 is also posing challenges to crypto skeptics in the gaming arena. An Asia-based game-focused... Uh, Fund manager is frustrated that investors he meets these days are overwhelmingly interested in knowing whether his fund has a Web3 angle. If I say I don't, they don't want to invest. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean that, that's one of the things that's so so concerning to me as well is like, we talk so often about how so many companies, <laughs> Fat Pat, what's up, dude? So many companies have already lost sight of what it means to just have a focus on creating great content and games, right? They, they, all they care about is that bottom line. They lean on these titles that they, you know, have become so popular and, and, um, they've lost sight of what it means to create great quality games and they're just focused on making money. This is just, uh, going to exacerbate that issue. Right. Um, and this kind of final paragraph here is really throwing that into, you know, um, an Asia-based game-focused fund manager is frustrated that investors he meets these days are overwhelmingly interested in knowing whether his fund has a Web3 angle. If I say I don't, they don't want to invest because all they care about is it's just my, and look, I get it. Gaming, the gaming is a business. It's an industry. It's a business. But at the end of the day, what gaming is for us is, is something we want good quality, fun content, right? And, and what this kind of, stuff is bringing to the table and and changing about the gaming industry is it's changing it from something that has traditionally we've fallen in love with with gaming of something that's fun it gives us an escape into something that's more like a job um and i don't want that man um it makes it feel like something you have to do to uh as an investment um and th look, I'll go right back to what I said before, too. They keep referencing, like, Axie Infinity as a uh, reference for how well it did. Axie Infinity got destroyed because the makers of Axie Infinity left a huge vulnerability on their back end that allowed them to get ha hacked for almost their entire cryptocurrency, uh, their crypto economy. So the game, the game got wrecked because no matter how secure... Yo, uh... Random mode, random mode time. Um, no matter how secure these uh, endeavors, these Web3 crypto based uh, pieces of software, I don't even like calling them games, man. Uh, they want to make you feel like they're going to be secure and, and it's going to be a great investment and stuff like that. You need to be very, very careful because... It doesn't matter if it's this or, I mean, anything you, you, you deal with, any company that um, you have information out there, there's always the potential for them to get hacked and have your information stolen. Same thing with this kind of uh, company right here, but you're talking about your finances as well, right? So um, there's always the potential to to get wrecked here. And, and I just don't like what all this this web three NFT blockchain crypto uh, econ uh, economy based gaming is bringing to the table for changing what we have always, what the reason we fell in love with games in the first place and turning it into more like a, a something that feels like a job for people. Uh, and the reason I dove into this is because of the title here, right? Like gaming vets promise to make blockchain games fun and sustainable. I'm not sure. I, 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 I highly, I, I'm highly doubtful of that. I just am. Uh, same hairstyle. <laughs> Fat Pat. Nice dude. Nice. I love that emote. 
and Gamer with a holiday cookie making me hungry, and Wick with the Bob Ross, dude. How uh, how is everybody today? Sorry, I'm ranting, dude. I I get so worked up. Oh, dude, that emo. I get so worked up about the whole crypto-based economy gaming stuff, dude. Really rubs me the wrong way. Um. Sony says it believes Xbox owning Call of Duty could influence users' console choice. Uh, absolutely. They're just going to attach Bitcoin miners into Fortnite? <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't know. I mean, uh... The thing that's unfortunate is, like, I, I don't think there's any way around it, you know? It's, um... There are too many juggernaut, huge, massive, powerful companies in the in the gaming industry that are just going to keep pushing money and time and resources into making sure that crypto economy based games and Web3 uh, continue to be a large part of what gaming is moving forward. And and. Ultimately, the only way we would be able to, and we talk about this a lot, the only way we we would be able to um, keep it from being part of the gaming industry is a united front of not taking part in it. You know, and it just won't happen, man. It just won't happen. Civic stat vacation tidy no work. Wait, civic. St that vacation today today no work today let's go gamer final fantasy 7 all day let's go dude the harder you crank 90s the more coin you make wick's gonna be rich dude <laughs> today yeah 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 cool gamer yeah awesome wick's gonna be rich uh, Wick, did you see the, uh, I, I shot you a highlight yesterday. I shot you a highlight. Yeah, dude, I did a bunch of content, uh, creation yesterday, last night. You guys want to see it? Here, up. Oh, okay, gamer, right on, dude. Right on. Here, let me, let me, sh let me, I'll, I'll throw this in chat for you guys real quick. Made a bunch of content last night. This one specifically had to do with Wick, so I was like, oh, I gotta send it. <laughs> Did you like that? Here, check this out, guys. Check this out. Check that clip out. That highlight. All right, Sony says it believes Xbox owning Call of Duty could influence users' console choice. Slept for 13 hours last night, dude. Good for you, man. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got, I don't know, about six, about six hours. Um, I am almost caught up on getting all, <laughs> all of my, my, my Twitch, uh, VODs highlighted and exported to YouTube. Then I got to, got to start working on getting everything made public, man. I'm getting, I'm getting work done. We're almost there. We're almost there. I've got so many highlights, dude. I've got so many highlights that I've, I've got to get put on like hover and, and stuff like that, man. It's crazy. Uh, I've got to get some new, um, uh, montages built up for for the community and the stream i got so many highlights to work with um sony says it believes xbox owning call of duty could influence users console choice uh regulatory docs uh 6 30 p.m to 7 30 a.m nice dude nice you don't usually sleep that much though you probably needed it man uh Regulatory docs reveal that PlayStation's firm's thoughts on the Activision Blizzard acquisition. Um, according to the company's official response to ac uh, uh, questions from Brazil's regulatory body, which, like many regions, is currently studying the proposed deal for approval. Uh, along with other companies such as Ubisoft, Amazon, and Google, Sony's responses to several questions about the proposed acquisition have been 
published in full by the Brazilian government. Sony's response, read by VGC, mostly outlines the current state of AAA game development for the Brazilian regulator. However, large portions highlight the importance the PlayStation firm puts on Call of Duty, a franchise which it claims influenced users' console choice. Um, in its questionnaire answers, Sony calls Call of Duty an essential game, a blockbuster, a AAA-type game that has no rival. According to a 2019 study, the importance of Call of Duty to entertainment in general is indescribable. Uh, the company said the brand was the only video game IP to break into the top 10 of all entertainment brands among fans, joining powerhouse such as Star Wars, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, and Lord of the Rings. Call of Duty is so popular that it influences users' choice of console, and its network of loyal users is so entrenched that even if a competitor had the budget to develop a similar product, it would not be able to rival it. Sony went on to explain how huge resources Activision puts behind Call of Duty are the core reason why it believes the FPS series is unlikely to be rivaled by a competitor. Each annual Call of Duty release takes approximately three to five years to develop. As Activision releases one Call of Duty game per year, this equates to an annual investment of hundreds of millions of dollars, it explained. Uh, approximately 1,200 people work on each version, of a, and another 1,500 are involved in publishing and distribu distribution. Thus, uh, Call of Duty alone has more developers than most game companies employ across its entire development portfolio, even AAA studios. Also, given its plans to recruit 2,000 additional developers by 2021, Activision probably expects Call of Duty to become even more successful in the future. No other developer can devote. It's still so broken. I know. I know. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking, Fat Pat. Yeah. No other developer can devote the same level of resources and expertise in game development. Even if they could, Call of Duty is overly entrenched so that no rival, no matter how relevant, can catch up. Sony went on to note that Call of Duty has been the top-selling game for almost every year for the past decade and for its genre is overwhelmingly the best-selling game. It is synonymous with first-person shooter games and essentially defines that category. Category, it said. This is all. This is also demonstrated by player engagement on social media. Call of Duty has over 24 million followers on Facebook versus 7 million for Battlefield, and over 12 million, fo million followers on Instagram versus 2 million for Battlefield. It added, to say the least, players would be unlikely to switch to alternate, alternate, alternative games, as they would lose the familiarity with uh, those skills and even the friends they made playing the game. Even in weaker years like 2021, Call of Duty still managed to outperform most other games by a considerable margin. Call of Duty Vanguard, for example, was widely regarded as weaker than previous year's titles, but was still one of the best-selling games of 2021. In other words, even in a bad year, players remained loyal to the brand and continued to buy the game. Unfortunately. This is what's uh, really making... This is uh, creating some really, really terrible issues within the gaming industry, right? Um, this is allowing developers to push out subpar products and continue to make a lot of money. And see, it's basically telling developers, it's okay. It's okay to keep pushing out. Yo, thanks, Wick. Okay. Uh Wait, what? Oh, dude, I know about this. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I'll read about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, it's not just Call of Duty, right? It's a lot of these big titles that that uh, these larger developers have started to lean on for a long time that uh, have issues, right? But people continue to buy them. They continue to buy them to a great extent and support these developers. Size, what's up, my friend? And it, it's creating a huge, huge, huge issue in the the, uh, the gaming industry of of uh, basically telling these developers that it's okay. You can just keep creating crap products and and it'll be fine. Do a podcast? I guess that's kind of what this is to an extent. <laughs> the news segment, you know, uh, to an extent is what it is kind of. Um, maybe, dude. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe so. 
Um, I like to talk enough. It wouldn't be a bad idea, I guess. <laughs> I need to do a, a bit of a research on it, maybe. But it feels bad. I mean, we talk about this all the time, too, right? Like, uh, that's the reason that things just keep getting... not getting better on this front is because these these developers keep coming out with subpar products and they keep being purchased and supported. And so they just keep making the same mistakes going, well, I mean, they bought it last time. They'll buy it again, right? And if, I mean, until, until it's not purchased anymore until they're not supported anymore. It's going to continue to happen. Um, in its first response to Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard, published in January, Sony said it expects Call of Duty games to remain multi-platform due to contractual agreements. Um, Microsoft's head of gaming also sub uh, subsequently confirmed his intention to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation platforms once Microsoft's ac acquisition of Activision Blizzard is complete. However, it was later claimed that Activision Blizzard is contractually committed to releasing only the next three Call of Duty games for PlayStation consoles, including this year's Modern Warfare 2. Uh, the Call of Duty series is regularly among PlayStation's most popular games. Last year, the series was both the first Vanguard and third Black Ops Cold War best-selling games on PlayStation in the U.S., according to NPD. So, I mean, here's the thing. Obviously, Sony... Sony is scared right now, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a video podcast, basically. Uh, only 815, right on size. Yeah. I'm sorry you're bored, dude. Hang out with us, buddy. Hang out with us. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe what I need to do is start trying to reach out and, and get some uh, some industry leaders, man, uh, on, on the, uh, the morning news segment. You know what I mean? Who knows? Maybe if we get to a point where... Uh, this gains a little bit of more traction, you know, as we, we continue to do these and, uh, we never know. You never know when you never know what it could turn into. I love doing the video gaming news. I, it's very important to me. Uh, I feel like other people that hang out, uh, obviously enjoy the content and, and, uh, like staying up to date with what's going on in the industry. And, and, um, maybe at some point, man, we gain some more traction. People get, become more aware of what we're doing here and, and we can start having some uh, guests on to discuss maybe what's going on in the industry. And and we'll get a little bit more uh, smoothie lord reporting for the news, dude. There you go. Um, maybe we'll, we'll get to a point where we can have a little bit of an influence over what's going on in the industry even, you know. That'd be great. <laughs> As opposed to, I mean... If we get to influence some of these things that we're constantly talking about that feel like a negative, you know, that's going on in the gaming industry to have some kind of positive influence uh, to change some of those things, how great would that be, you know? So ultimately, look, Call of Duty is a big deal. Sony uh, is kind of crap in their pants right now. <laughs> uh, uh, as they should be. But look, I think what Sony is trying to do here is is say this is anti-competitive, right? Uh, this has been our game, you know. Like, like if 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 Xbox buys Activision, this becomes an Xbox only. If Microsoft buys Activision, this becomes an Xbox only game. It it is going to have catastrophic effects. I mean, maybe Sony should have tried to play into this before Xbox did. I don't, I don't know, dude. Um, I don't think that Sony's going to be able to keep this acquisition from happening. To be honest, I don't. I, I see where they're coming from. It's a big deal. Yeah. And it's going to, uh, I think, yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna have a significant impact on people that decide to buy an Xbox console over a, a PlayStation console, just solely due to the fact that 
Call of Duty is going to be uh, a uh, Xbox proprietary title moving forward after this acquisition happens. Yep. You can bet on that. Xbox, Xbox is, is uh, putting themselves in a very, very nice position moving forward. I mean, here's the thing. Microsoft slash Xbox buying Activision Blizzard. This is a single title we're talking about here, right? A single title. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't think they're going to release it at all on PlayStation. I think that it's going to be a, a day one release uh, on Xbox. I think it will be day one release on Xbox and probably uh, hit their streaming service before it ever makes its way to uh, PlayStation console. And then it will. And then it will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's business, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just business, right? I mean, yeah, you're not wrong, Wick. You're not wrong. Uh, well, right, gamer. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I'm in the same boat as you, buddy. But, um, you can't deny the fact that there are a lot of Call of Duty fanboys and fangirls in the world. That's, I mean, that's what this article was about, right? And um, it, it absolutely does have an influence on people. Uh, they, they, love, they love Call of Duty. I, I'm not a big fan. I used to play it back in the day, but the game fell off to me, man. And, and I haven't been a, a fan of Call of Duty for a long time. Um, but there are still a lot of people that really enjoy the game. And it, it's absolutely going to have an influence over uh, people deciding if, if it, if it, if it becomes a, a day one release only on like Xbox, like we're talking about, there is absolutely going to have a uh, an effect on console sales. Super Donut, what's up, my dude? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Wick. Absolutely. Yep. And this is, this is what's important to bring up right now. I mean, we're talking about a single title. A single title out of the portfolio coming to Microsoft and Xbox out of the Activision Blizzard lineup of IPs, right? This is a single title that is going to have this kind of impact. This is not even discussing all the other kinds of, of titles that they're going to have access to to revamp and is going... I mean, this has a significant, significant impact on the industry as a whole, um, but especially for Xbox. Sign you up? Right on, dude. I, I know it's a Modern War Warfare 2 remake, and, and I played Modern Warfare 2 as well, but I just don't feel like they can create decent games, dude. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't think they can make decent games anymore. Super Donut, what's up, dude? How was work, man? Uh, yeah. You just worked out for three hours, dude? Good night. You have way more energy than I do, man. What are we talking about? Work was good? Good, dude. I'm glad. Uh, basically, Sony is... Um, there's some reports that, that came... Uh, that were made public in Brazil, man. Regarding um, the influence that... Basically, Sony is saying Call of Duty is going to have over console sales moving forward after uh, after if and after Xbox uh, or Microsoft buys out Activision Blizzard solely due to Call of Duty more than likely going to be become a proprietary title on Xbox, right? Um, it, that's basically what it was, was coming down to, you know. Hey, it was us discussing just that particular uh, 
you know, avenue of, of what this was also discussing. And then uh, some of what uh, Xbox will probably do in regards to utilizing that title, you know. Fill the freezer with 16 pounds of ice. Did you old school it, dude? Just a big, big brick of ice. Use the, the ice clamp, dude. <laughs> Throw it up in the freezer, dude. Oh, yeah, uh, significantly. And that's what Wick was bringing up. Um, you know, he was like, well, I don't, I don't know that Microsoft would do that because they would be missing out on a lot of sales. My pivot there, my idea there was that He's right, but I think what I think what Xbox would do is go day one release on Xbox, and then maybe even at the same time or a little bit after it will release on um, Xbox's streaming service, right? Um, and then later on, after sales start going down a little bit on Xbox they'll maybe let it release on PlayStation as well or something. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> he said, a hundred bags of ice? <laughs> Jeez, dude. Oh, man. That's a workout. That's a workout in and of itself, dude. Are you, is that Was that the three hours right there? Good night. That probably would have taken me three hours. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. You had to fill the freezer with 16, so you mean 10 pounds, uh, 10 bags of ice at 16 pounds, right? 10 pack, 10 bags of ice. Is that what you mean? Fill the freezer with 16 pounds of ice. Or was it 160 pounds? Which one was it, dude? 160 pounds or was it 100 pounds? 100 bags, 1,600 pounds. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so each bag was 16 pounds. 100 bags, 1,600 pounds. That's math. That's just math. <laughs> That's just math, guys. Uh, I need some more Java. Uh, yes, three head. The three heads. Let's go. Xbox has been second place for years and years. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely, gamer. I mean, and if you think that they went into this acquisition without a a uh, primary thought in mind of taking Call of Duty um, and turning it into the main, one of their main thoughts about acquiring Activision Blizzard was to primarily take Call of Duty and specifically turn it into their their uh their their main kind of cash cow as it were to begin the venture after acquisition it doesn't mean they don't have a lot of very other lucrative uh projects that are going to come out of this but this was it man this was it absolutely yeah mathing's hard <laughs> NFL star Kyler Murray's new contract prepares for Modern Warfare 2 drop off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, if, uh, like, if you're not into sports and stuff, basically, Kyler Kyler Murray just got a new, like, what was it, like a four or five year contract, I think. Uh, oh, wait. I had to do legs, shoulders, and biceps today. Job is very labor intensive, and I average about 15K steps a day right now. I don't, dude. You're staying in shape, man. You're staying in shape. Right on, dude. I need to work out. I need to work out. I've been feeling so tired here lately, man. It feel I I hate that. I hate trying to make myself uh work out whenever I feel exhausted, you know. And I've 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 felt just tired like the past four or five days. I don't know why. Uh, NFL star Kyler Murray's new contract prepares for the Modern Warfare Two drop off. So it, within this contract, there was uh some print that said. What was it? How many was it like a certain amount of, of hours a day or or hours a week or whatever? Uh Murray had to do uh basically self study or whatever on um the upcoming opponent for the week, right? 
Um, and it could not be distracted. He could not be distracted by any anything else. Um, and it became a huge deal in, in the in the sports uh, the sporting world. Uh, the reason we're 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 reading this and thanks, Wait, for bringing this up was because is because it has to do with modern warfare too. Okay, uh, Arizona Cardinals quarterback Kyler Murray signed a new two hundred twenty million extension that includes a clause that attempts to curtail his Call of Duty addiction ahead of Modern Warfare 2's release. Kyler Murray is one of the most dynamic players in the NFL, both as a deadly passer and lightning quick runner. While he's becoming a star in the league, he's also becoming a big name in the uh, gaming and the Call of Duty Twitch scene and signed with uh, FaZe Clan back in April 2021. Now, after he signed his gargantuan extension to stay with the Cardinals, users on social media noticed a clause in his contract and might have to do with his dedication to Call of Duty. Uh... After inking the deal on July 25th, reporters noticed a clause in the contract that requires Murray to dedicate four hours of independent study per week where Murray cannot be engaged in other activities including watching television, playing video games, or browsing the internet. Noting video games in the activities Baird uh, could be significant and social media sleuths did further digging to see if annual... Call of Duty releases impacted his performance in the past. Turns out this could be the case, and why the Cardinals included the uh, clause in the first place. The Washington Post reported a study that found in games played before the annual Call of Duty release date over his career, Murray has averaged 22.5 fantasy points per game. In games played after the release date, Murray has averaged 17.4 points per game, a decline of 22.7%. Uh... (laughs) There have been visual graphs made. It seems completely ridiculous, but each year Call of Duty was released around the exact time the quarterback's performance did decrease fairly significantly. With Modern Warfare 2 remastered slated for an October 28 release, it looks like the Cardinals did their due diligence to make sure Kyler won't get distracted by his performance on Rust or a Favela so he can go out and help win some NFL games. That's actually hilarious. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's that's what's so crazy about today, uh, like, with technology and everything, too. Is, uh, dude, people, people, they see everything, man, you know? Dieting is rough. They've got to eat a lot of protein. Yeah, man. Um, I remember, you know, I mean, that, that that's one of the huge things about uh, fitness that, uh, people that aren't real educated on fitness overlook quite a bit until they do become educated is what an important part of fitness um, nutrition takes, right? And uh, I've been there, dude. I've been there. I remember, man, just the amount of protein that I was intaking. Uh, I was trying. I was eating between four and five thousand calories a day at one point in my life. Uh, whenever I was working out all the time. And was still just having a, a, a difficult, difficult time gaining weight. And I mean, to the point of where I was making uh, protein drinks with um, oatmeal in it to suck up the uh, protein so it would digest slower while I would eat it and stuff. Um, and it would be like drinking protein shakes, chewing protein shakes because it would have oatmeal in it and stuff. Just pounding, flipping boiled eggs all the time, dude. Um, all chicken breast all the time, man. Uh, you name it. It was, it was, it was crazy, dude. I was just constant. I mean, I eat all the time now, but I just eat trash now. (laughs) Lose weight, so I can only have 1800 calories a day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and, uh, of course, you know, like you're, you're saying right now, nutrition, uh, is, has to be formed around what you're trying to get done according to your own kind of, uh, fitness plan. Right. So, you're trying to pack on, you're going to be, you know, just plowing away at calories and stuff. And and if you're trying to, uh, you know, there's all different ways. Like if you're trying to lose some weight, then you're going to be counting calories. And there's a lot of, you know, how much protein, how many carbs can you have, you know, you know, the kinds of grains you need, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Yo, Super Donut, do you know what quinoa is? Question for you there. How insane. People went back and did the math. The, the, oh yeah, and they redid the contract. Yeah, I saw that, Wick. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, they redid the contract. Yeah, it was uh, pretty funny because uh, the Cardinals started getting about a bunch of backlash on it too, you know. And um, both sides were like getting ripped apart. They was like, well, they were like, why did you sign this with this clause in it? And then the Card- Cardinals were getting hit up for it for like, why did you guys feel like it was necessary to throw this in here, you know? And and both sides were like, <laughs> this, this is insane. This blew up. This wasn't supposed to be a big deal. Uh, yeah, and then they removed them all. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty wild. Yeah, chicken every day. Yeah, good. I'm glad you know what quinoa is. Yeah, very high protein. If you guys, if anybody else doesn't know what quinoa is, it's a very, very high protein uh, grain. Uh, it's cooked very similar to what rice, the way rice is cooked, but a uh, very high protein grain. Yeah. PS Plus is getting one of uh, gaming's most beloved franchises. Sony is gearing up to bring one of gaming's most beloved franchises to PS Plus before this year comes to a close. In a general sense, the number of titles on PS Plus have already expanded greatly in recent months following the creation of PS Plus Premium and PS Plus Extra. Now, those tiers of the service are about to become even more worthwhile as the entire Yakuza series from Sega will soon be available via the PS Plus subscription platform. Uh, Sony revealed this week that the entirety of the Yakuza franchise, uh, outside of its spin-off entries, will come to PS Plus in the near future. These additions will kick off next month when Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is the most recent entry in the series, becomes available for all PS Plus subscribers as part of August's free game lineup. To go along with this, Yakuza 0, Kiwami, Kiwami 2, and then uh, will then all be coming to PS Plus in August as well. Yakuza 3 Remastered, 4 Remastered, 5 Remastered, and 6 The Song of Life are all then are then all planned to hit PS Plus at an undetermined date before the end of the year. Um, even though the full Yakuza saga will soon be playable via PS Plus, it's worth noting that the whole series isn't going to be available via all tiers of the service. Instead, here's what versions of PS Plus you need to you will need in order to play certain entries. Uh, Yep, there they all are. I'll link this in chat. As a whole, this is a major boost for PS Plus and brings one of Sega's biggest franchises to the platform. I've heard these games are a lot of fun. Um, And really wild. Yeah. With Yakuza 8 currently in development, now might be the perfect time to give these games a shot if you've never played any of them previously. Uh, I'll put this in chat. So if you need to take a look at the list and what tier they're on and everything, it's there, okay? That's cool. Those are supposed to be very good games. I've never played them, but I would like to. Uh, I do have PS Plus right now, and it's okay. I bought the most expensive tier, and it's kind of underwhelming. Quite a few games, but none of them worth playing, really. Yeah? See, uh, so our buddy Gamer Extreme, he uh, he had Game Pass for a long time. And then whenever uh, PS Plus came out, he switched over and uh, is saying, at this point, he is enjoying... I th- Gamer, let me know if I'm wrong here. I don't want to misspeak. But last time I had heard feedback from Gamer... Uh, that I remember was that his experience with PS plus at this point was uh, better than what he was getting out of game pass. But you're not really all that thrilled with it, huh? Microsoft says there is nothing unique about Activision Blizzard games. Microsoft has told New Zealand regulators that there is nothing unique about Activision Blizzard titles in its latest bid to get its price e merger approved. In a document presented to the Business Acquisition and uh, Authoriz- Authorizations Commerce Commission, Microsoft says that the gaming giant doesn't produce any must have titles and should therefore be permitted to go ahead with the acquisition. This is going back to this Call of Duty thing, I guarantee you. Um, very thrilled to. The uh, with the ability to play PS and PS2 games, but there aren't uh, that many available. Yeah, look, uh, this is one of those things that I've gone back to uh, here lately. Uh, that I'm I'm not real thrilled with um, PlayStation about is, in my opinion, if you're going to support a company by like buying their console. Their console should be backwards compatible with uh, previous gen. Like, so for play, PlayStation's always been disc, right? 
And the fact that PS5 still has a, an optical uh, uh, drive version, to me, uh, it feels real bad that their PS5 is not backwards compatible. You know, um, for many of us that have been customers and supporters of a company like that for a very long time, um, I find it concerning that they are not allowing the the console to be backwards compatible and instead are going, well, uh, even though you own the games, uh, maybe for our older consoles, we want you to pay to either own the digital copies or we want you to pay for a subscription service to play those titles. Uh, that to me feels bad. That to me feels bad. Yo, uh, Size Matters, thanks for being here, buddy. It's good to see you, man. I hope you've been well. Um... I don't know, man. Rest well and uh, take it easy, my friend. It's good to see you. So that's one of the things that really kind of drives me nuts. Xbox does a better job at um, doing backwards compatible stuff. And if you remember, the, the PS3, if you got one of the original models of the PS3, they are at least backwards compatible with PS1, PS2, and can play PS3 games. So that might be a play. But um, Xbox has even got a patent out there. They're working on a, a system where if you own older Xbox games, um, they're working on a technological incorporation right now where you can actually hook up a, an optical drive uh, to a, an Xbox if it doesn't have one, uh, uh, one of their newer Xboxes, or just put one of your old discs in, and it will read it and go oh, this is your copy of one of our older games. You now own it, uh, but you have to rescan it every so often for them to go, yeah, you still this is you still have it. This is still yours to continue to be able to play it. But um, that's actually another really cool incorporation from Xbox that I feel like they're doing a much better job over some uh, a company like Sony is, you know. Um, I don't know. The streaming of PS3 games is much better than it was with PS9. Well, that's good. That's good. I know that doesn't necessarily hit on exactly what you were saying with that, what, you know, what I started talking, you know, your statement in chat, thrilled with the ability to play PS2 and PS1 games, but that's one of the areas where I have not been real uh, happy with Sony. Yeah. As opposed to Xbox, who seems like they're doing a much better job for their uh, customer base that has been fans of their their console and their games for a long time and has uh, maintained that collection and, and uh, is allowing them easy ways to be able to play those titles and... and uh, Without having to bust out like old consoles and stuff. Premium and Game Pass are similar in one way. I have found each has AAA titles and titles that are not very well known. Yeah, for sure. The amount of games on Game Pass compared to the amount on PS Plus is better cost-wise. Gotcha, gamer, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there were always going to be a lot of similarities uh, in regards to the way these subscription services work. Uh in that regard, right? They're always going to have the month to month. These are the new big titles we're bringing out. These are the titles that are going away. They're going to have some more ob obscure titles that you're not maybe quite as familiar with. Things like that, right? Biz and King, what's up, my friend? How are you today? Happy Monday, buddy. However, I can play War of the Monsters, so I'm pretty happy. Sly Cooper, dude. I haven't thought about that game in a long time. Wow. Wow. Byzantine, how are you, buddy? Uh, so again, we already kind of hit on a little bit of this this morning, but, uh, Microsoft has told New Zealand regulators, that there's nothing unique. Uh, so, so they're trying to play this Microsoft's trying to play, uh, play the card that we're just buying a company that needs help, right? There, there, there is no title within their, uh, portfolio 
that is going to make us stand out above anybody else. I don't believe that. Uh, especially uh, Call of Duty, we've already talked about. Just uh, Even though Call of Duty uh, has not been developed very well over the past number of years, just that name alone is pretty significant. Um, this claim is part of Microsoft's efforts to alleviate fears that its Activision Blizzard merger threatens the gaming industry, creating issues surrounding competition in the market. In doing this, Microsoft has said that its rivals would get by just fine without Activision Blizzard titles and would still be able to compete in a vibrant gaming market. The vast majority of games are developed and published by parties other than Activision Blizzard, such as Sony, Nintendo, EA, and Take-Two, reads the document addressing concerns over uh, monopolization of the industry. Specifically, the respect with respect to Activision Blizzard video games, there is nothing unique about the video games developed and published by Activision Blizzard. The statement continues, there are no must-haves for the rival PC and console video game distributors that could give rise to a foreclosure concern. This might sound surprisingly harsh language coming from the tech giant that wants to buy the studio, but it's unlikely that it's referring to the quality of Activision Blizzard games. Rather, it seems to be a statement intended for regulators who may not understand the gaming market, and therefore need to be made aware that Activision Blizzard doesn't have a monopoly on a particular genre. But hey, it's a pretty funny read regardless. This isn't the only point the company raises to ease concerns that the merger would give them an unfair advantage in the, uh, in the industry. Microsoft also claims that the gaming industry has low barriers to entry, meaning that content will remain available for dis uh, distribution to rival PC, console, and mobile distributors. It's looking increasingly like Microsoft will soon have the regulatory approval it needs to go ahead with the merger. As we recently reported, the deal could get permission from U.S. regulators as soon as August potentially just weeks away. It depends on whether or not the companies are requested to present further evidence to the regulators. If not, the deal can go ahead. Yes, uh, look, this is one of my big things. Uh, Got to go into the office for most of the week. We'll be MIA for most of the week. No! Uh, tell them, you know, look, Biz and King. Tell the office that OA said that you don't need to go in. You don't need to go in. Do it like that. Usually that works. It works in The Witcher. It works in Star Wars. Uh, I don't need to go in this week. Do it like that. And then also go, I'm also going to steal your pod racer. Everything will work. It'll be fine. Um, that's usually, uh, you know. I think in The Witcher, you got to do like something like this. Like, <laughs> and then it'll be fine. They'll let you, they'll let you buy. And you can hang out with us all week. Uh, and, 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 uh, all <laughs> like <laughs> reality, like, I hope you have a good week, dude. I'm sorry. You have to go in this week. Yeah, I know. Wick, isn't it really odd? Yeah. It's like a big, big show that they put on. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really odd. Yeah. Um, this is what I've been saying from the, like, whenever the, uh, whenever the, the announcement was made that Microsoft was, uh, in agreement to purchase Activision Blizzard, this was one of my, like, very first takes on this entire subject was, this individual needs to be ousted. Um, Bobby Kotick needs to be gotten rid of in order for Microsoft to take a, an actual dedicated maneuver in changing Activision Blizzard for the better in, 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 in changing what Activision Blizzard was from that toxic, nasty environment that everybody knows it was where Bobby Kotick was always the head of it. Um, there will always be nastiness within that company, a stigma of, of bad stuff, as long as this individual is still at the head of it. Microsoft has got to get rid of Bobby Kotick. If, if they buy out Activision Blizzard and this individual is allowed to remain at the top, that is, it is a, a horrible, horrible, horrible move on the part of Microsoft. Um, well, right, yeah. Um, backwards compatibility is a different subject as far as taking a disc and putting it into the console. 
I'm not sure what it would take tech wise to be able to play. Oh, they've already got the. Uh... They've already got the tech, dude. It's not. It's not even a deal. The only backwards compatible uh, thing that would take a bit more resource and money to implement for the PS5 is the PS3 backwards compatibility. It's already noted that like PS1, PS2, P uh, well, and the PS5 can already play PS4. Uh, PS1 and PS2 uh, backwards compatibility. Uh, the the um, the technology is already there. They already. They already know. They it can already be implemented. It's well known. That's the thing, gamer. It's not that they can't do it. It's that they they don't want to do it because they want to make more money off people. Whereas Xbox is doing everything they can to um, basically give their customers that that have really been true to them throughout the years those abilities. You know what I mean? Um, that's what really throws me off about Sony. We know that they have the capability. It could have been incorporated with PS5 a long time ago. Um, from what I understand. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Like I said, they, they, they have the capability. They have the tech already. It's already been developed for them to be able to, to make the PS5 backwards compatible for PS1 and PS2. Um, the PS3, from what I understand, backwards compatibility stuff would require a little bit more money, a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, PS1 and PS2 is already there. They just aren't, aren't doing it. PS3 is the only issue right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yep, yep. So... I don't know. It's going to happen. And we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll see more as, as we move forward. This will be the last article I have. Uh, shout out to Wick. Thanks for uh, shooting me that article about Kyler Murray. That was actually, uh, that's funny. Yeah, we hadn't talked about that yet. If anybody has anything else, I'm just going to kind of skim this real quick. This will be the last article we have for the morning. Um, if anybody has anything else to bring up that I haven't talked about today or in previous news segments that um, you would like to discuss, or, or uh, bring up that could be pertinent for the industry, video gaming news, then let me know and we'll discuss it before uh, we move on to The Witcher 3 for today, okay? Um, yeah, we, uh, gamer. so from what I understand, um, so again, I mean, the PS3 backwards compatibility issue would require more resources, more uh, to get some like coding stuff done um, and potentially millions more dollars. But PS1 and PS2 backwards compatibility is already taken care of. It's already a capability. They just aren't implementing it. Yep. That's everything that uh, I have been made aware of uh, regarding that that topic for PlayStation. Mm -hmm. Asus and MSI are the first AIB partners making new PCs with Intel Arc A380s and, and Arc A310 entry-level graphics cards coming soon. Uh, Intel's new Arc A-series uh, desktop GPUs launched without even a whimper, with the new GPUs being an exclusive to China for many months. Yeah, we saw this. We've seen, uh, we've kept track just a little bit. We've seen some benchmarks coming in from China. Uh, we've been waiting on more testers in here in the West, like Europe and, and the U.S. and stuff, to get their hands on it to to see uh, uh, some other benchmarking stuff, uh, to get a better idea of matching up with with the uh, more of the you know China China China's benchmarks to to see where everything is kind of gonna like play out. Um, it appears AIB partners are now getting some of that that. Arc Silicon to make entry-level graphics cards for some upcoming pre-built PCs. Uh, Gunner, G-U-N-N-I-R, started it all with their custom Arc 380 Photon OC uh, 6G graphics card, the ASRock. 
Now we have an Asus and MSI leaping into the game. Intel Arc A380 cards from Asus and MSI come from Leaker Momomo underscore US on Twitter, where MSI lists its new PC with Intel Core i5-12400 or Core i5-12400F for the lower-end SKU. While the higher-end system has an Intel Core i7-12700 or a Core i7-12700F processor. Uh, systems can be configured with three different GPUs. A custom MSI GeForce GTX 1650, MSI GeForce GT 1030, or an Intel GT... G DG2 A380 or Intel DG2 A310 graphics card. Uh, four gigs of VRAM on each Arc A380 and Arc A310 graphics card. Um, Asus, on the other hand, has two systems with the A380 A card. The ROG Strix GT15 system packing the higher end NVIDIA GeForce 3080 down to the entry level ARC A380 graphics card. Uh, no higher end ARC A770 here just yet. Since it's still a while off, the only samples exist uh, are with YouTubers for some videos and to select reviewers in the coming months. Um, everything we know so far about like these, these kind of Intel Arc A380, A310 cards that, that have come out uh, from the benchmarks in China are that they're uh, they're not incredibly powerful. They're uh, I think kind of more on par with like an Nvidia 1060, so, uh, somewhere along those lines. We need we need more benchmarking here in the West to you know put up side by side with what China has pushed out as well to, to really get a, a, a finalized idea of what they're going to offer as far as uh, capabilities for graphics processing. But it's uh, Intel's entry level into the uh, GPU standalone graphics card market. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not surprised to have them come in at a, a little bit of a, a, a more subtle level of, of cards and probably work their way up right but as time moves forward we get the cards coming out and, and get more benchmarking and testing we'll, we'll take a, a look and, and see what they have to offer at this point I mean obviously Nvidia and and Nvidia is has always been the top of the market for graphics cards AMD has slowly worked their way up to being competitive um, as same way they have with CPUs uh, at, uh, in regards to competing with Intel in, in that market. And uh, Intel's just kind of doing the same thing. They, they they finally decided they wanted to get into the GPU market. Uh, they're, they're starting kind of soft and, and they'll eventually work their way up as long as uh, they continue to be somewhat successful uh, in making decent quality graphics cards, right? They, that's the way it'll work. Um, that's what we have for today. Cool guys, uh, thank you for being a part of it, for um, engaging in, in, in what we find for video gaming news, man. I love doing this. I love uh, doing it with you guys and hanging out and discussing a lot of these topics. If you are viewing this on YouTube as a VOD and you're enjoying the content, consider hitting that like and subscribe button and maybe come hang out with us at 6 o'clock a.m. CST where we always start every single stream out with video gaming news, okay? Other than that, everybody just stay healthy, stay safe, be kind, and we'll catch everybody tomorrow for August 2nd's edition of Video Gaming News.